Welcome, everyone, to the first live recording of Reviewing the News. Um, happy to have you all here. Very happy to have Cody here. I was just thinking about the fact that the whole origin story of Reviewing the News uh, happened when you were in Crested Butte. We did a blister speaker series at Western Colorado University, and then, I mean, we we just talked straight for like three days, I think. And then I was finally driving you back to the Gunnison airport and you were like, man, we should, you know, this has been pretty good. Like we should kind of do something together. And I was like, well, what should we do? And he's like, well, you should probably have me on the podcast more. And I'm like, that's a really good idea, but what should we talk about? And he's like, well, you guys review stuff. So we should review the news. So, I, you know it pains me to give credit to this guy, <laughs> but he literally, it was his idea for the Blister Awards, which will kick off tomorrow night. Reviewing the news was entirely his idea, and there turns out I, I quite like both of those ideas, and um, it's been really fun to get uh, your feedback and comments and, and just see how many folks come up to me now uh, in particular to say that they, for some reason, uh, enjoy the conversations. So, uh, yeah, good job, I guess. Thank you. I yeah. was wondering if we were going to replicate the very first podcast I recorded with you, Ooh. which was at like 10 at night, down the hall, downstairs, after like four cocktails and like a half a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. I was wondering if that was going to happen tonight <clears throat> again. It, it creates a lot looser conversation. It's for true. Sure. It's true. You'll hear um, the real, real truth. Yeah, you can you can all go still listen to that. Comp that was a Gear Thirty, it was, I think, yeah. and uh, we talked about coffee. That was when we first realized we were both into coffee. Yep. And uh, yeah, so you can go listen to that. The speech definitely gets a bit slurred in that one. Yeah. Um, so I'm on water right now. So um, I I'm ahead of you. Yeah, you are. Um, also, this is, you know, you remember me saying this is supposed to be a bit of a competition. I don't know. I'm not feeling that competitive right now. I'm just happy to have you all here. And it's because he knows he's going to lose. It's... <laughs> all right, I'm back in. <laughs> it's all it takes. Um, yeah. Um, so, well, um, I did want to say a little bit about your travel story here. You know, usually when we kick these things off, it's a bit of a catch up, how have you been? Uh, it very much seemed like your trip just to get here to the summit seemed like it could have been an episode of the 50. It could have taken the first 20 minutes of the Baffin movie for <laughs> sure. It was a full expedition. And I, I was like, hmm, five minutes away from pulling the pin entirely and just leaving, turning around in the Denver airport and catching a flight back home. Because uh, I don't know how many people have kids, probably a lot, but you, if you do, you know that how stressful it is flying with a toddler and then to add in ski gear and then a trip that is kind of short in general, um, stresses that come with family. Even we brought our dog here too because we didn't have a dog sitter. And um, our first flight was delayed so late that we we're gonna miss our connection, which meant an overnight in Denver so we didn't want to do that so we rescheduled we flew into Denver that got delayed then it got delayed all the way until was it Tuesday morning mm -hmm. at like 8 a.m. so I ended up that was about that moment when we were sitting there just like you just got shit everywhere and your kids running around he hasn't slept and hasn't had a nap it's past his bedtime he's about to explode and I almost pulled the pin and just flew home but mm -hmm. we ended up renting a car and driving here and getting here at 1 30 in the morning and getting to bed at 3 30 and so I apologize if I talked to you any anybody yesterday and I seemed really out of it it was because I was completely out of it I had like three hours of sleep so yeah. um, doing better today hmm. so on the one hand points you know for audibling getting in that rental car getting in at 1 30 in the morning but as you think about who is gonna win here I never thought about leaving you <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna be here. I was gonna ski with a broken arm and then go have to get surgery. I just want my commitment level to you and his. So, just saying. Um, all right, man. Well, where do you want to? Actually, I don't want to ask you where we want to begin the evening because um, I think we should begin here. There was a very interesting article that came out recently. Um, called Cody Townsend Should Quit the 50. And... Um, you got to finish the headline, too, because that's a bit of part of it. 
Well, then I have to pull up the headline. Okay. Well, I read Cody Townsend should quit the 50 while he's ahead and alive. Uh, yeah, you're right. I should have definitely not left that part out. Um, and, well, first of all, I just thought um, this would be a good opportunity for you to reply to this article. Totally. Right. I've, I've wanted to kind of write, uh, not a rebuttal, because ultimately, like, this opinion piece was written by a guy, Matt Cote, who's a very experienced backcountry skier, prominent ski mountaineer, and a very good writer, and it was well-written. Yeah. And yeah. But the premise of it, I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I think about this all the time. <laughs> and we I, talk about it all the time, and you talk about it in 50 episodes all the time. Exactly. And so, like, a rebuttal to it, I'm like, well, that's the story of this project, and that's mm. what is kind of... The, the through line from when I started it until today and what happens in the future, well, that's the story that's going to be told. And I've been very explicit with my goals through this project the entire time of being like, it literally is number one rule, don't die. Number two rule, have fun. Number three rule, ski the 50. And it's very specific in that priority. So the article um, got quite a lot of it inflamed a lot of opinion, especially on social media. And social media is not a great place for nuanced discourse by any means. But I appreciated this actually being out here. Um, Matt actually reached out to me before he wrote it, said that he had gotten uh, Sierra Schaefer, the editor of Ski Magazine, to he pitched it, she okayed it. Then he reached out to me to get kind of a few facts straight and then just let me know. And I wrote back saying like, yeah, I'm completely supportive of this because ultimately like this is the story of the project for myself. This is exactly what goes on through my mind the entire time. So having this out there in the media, I actually think is a good thing because this tends to counteract um, typical narratives of media, which like headlines that are big accomplishments, like headlines, like FKTs and the big stars and the big heroes and conquering things. Mm -hmm. It's like, it fits well into a headline. So to see an opinion piece coming from Ski Magazine to say like, no, like don't finish, I actually think is a healthy thing to have out there. Um, it wasn't, it didn't create healthy dialogue by any means because I think ultimately that headline was really inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And I will say, when you have other people in the world talking about your imminent potential death, it's quite awkward. <laughs> it's, um, you know, like when people are judging whether you have the ability to stay alive and the, the consequences of to your actions and other people are talking about it, you're like, whoa, this is weird. Like people yeah. are debating my own death. Yeah. Um, it, it's awkward. And I think that's where it really inflamed a lot of opinion. Um, but ultimately I like, I was supportive of it cause I think it's ultimately a good message to have out there. And I think it's been a through line of the 50 as I've been trying to slowly tell people through this whole project that it's not about the number, the, the grand irony of the project being that it is a numbered series. It's an objective based series. I called it the 50. But through it, through the individual stories of being like, no, it's about the adventure, it's about the growth, it's about the learning, it's about the friends, it's about the camaraderie, the community, and the like challenging yourself. Um, I've really come to the conclusion that I think it's in life really, really important to have big challenges in life, to put yourself to do things you don't think you can do. But like, it is the cliche that it isn't the accomplishment or the finishing of it. It is everything that goes into it that is truly like the reward. So so overall, I was supportive of it. And there was a few things I disagreed with. I want to hear about those. All right. Yeah. Um, well, actually, the writer dork in me um, <laughs> wrote to Matt and told him, like, we were back and forth because he, he kind of got concerned when he saw all the very inflamed op opinions of about it. And uh, he's like, oh, well, that did not do well on Instagram. And mm. I was like, yeah, it's yeah. Instagram. <laughs> what, the, yeah. what do you expect? But um, the writer dork in me, I offered some thoughts of just like, there is one section 
which he's kind of talking about, let me pull this up, uh, is more of a characterization of myself and saying like we put out the Joffrey rescue video as a form of self-congratulation. Um, and then I've been making mistakes even though I might not even know them in, in the time or something like that. And I actually was like, I'm fine with the characterization. It's impossible to uphold people's thoughts of who you are. Like you, like everyone in this room has probably seen an episode and has a different, slightly different opinion about it. And you can't control that. You do you, the best you can to tell this, the, the story you want to tell, but ultimately like people are gonna have different interpretations of it. So that was his interpretation of me. But mm -hmm. the writer dork in me was like, it actually just didn't add to your thesis. It was just like, mm -hmm. you're talking yeah. about the consequences of the 50, the trappings of backcountry skiing, of objective-based skiing, of making this project that's been very successful. And then you kind of go into these like kind of characterizations of myself. And I was like, it just didn't fit. And mm -hmm. he, the good thing was he actually had an editor from uh, another magazine wrote to him and said the exact same thing. Huh. So it was, that was the only thing I was the writer dork in me. I was like, you could have used more examples of me fucking up and seeming dumb more to the point of yeah. your thesis yeah. being like, you should quit before you die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, there were, I, again, I do, I, I, um, I maybe don't always think I come across amazing writing everywhere in sort of the outdoor space. I did think this was really well written. I do agree. And, um, but I thought some of those comments, I had that kind of same reaction. So um, uh, anyway. Yeah, overall, and it's a media narrative, like the, what I was saying of accomplishments, like I had, um, why I liked this too, is having this out there, having other people out there, not just that it's me qu quitting, because like I've told people, especially in the close circle, like the most likely outcome of this is I don't complete all 50. That's always been the case. Mm -hmm. And I've said it many times <clears throat> before I even started, I had to get comfortable with the knowledge that like the most likely outcome is you're not going to finish where, yeah. for whatever reason, whether that's risk, whether that's time commitments, family or climate change, there's mm -hmm. a lot of odds stacked against me. Um, so like having someone else say that like, oh, you should potentially quit because of this. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, see, it's not just me. But from the media stuff, I've had uh, the senior editor of a very major magazine he'd like DM me and say, hey, when are you going to finish the project? And I was like, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> like two, between two and 20 years is mm -hmm. my standard answer. And um, he's like, OK, cool. Well, let me know when you finish so then we can give you our like uh, adventure or big award of the year thing. And I'm like, wow. So yeah. you probably haven't watched a single episode. Yeah. And you're incentivizing me to finish to say, oh, we'll give you like cover of the magazine and the big adventure mm -hmm. of the year award. I mm -hmm. was like, that was fucking lame. <laughs> like, and yeah. I, it was, it was, that was kind of like, so that's why this article, I'm like, yeah, this is better. This is yeah. written from a skier. This is written from an experienced person, not some senior editor in a major magazine that I guess doesn't really pay attention. Yeah. By the way, there was also another article that came out about you uh, very recently. And one of the things that actually really surprised me about this, I don't remember the title, but it did say something about the old, like, he's out to conquer the mountains. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, we're still talking about this. Like, does anybody who actually go into the mountains ever, like, conquering is like the last thing. And so like, I still, I'm literally confused. Why? Like, I was just thinking, you know, people go swim across, you know, big channels or the ocean or something. And I don't know that writers are like, that person conquered the ocean. <laughs> but we do this with mountains. And I, I think for those of us who spend any amount of time, conquering is the last thing I think you're thinking about. 100%. I mean, it was back, the original spirit of mountaineering was that. Like, you, when you read, uh, is Into the Silence by Wade Davis. Mm -hmm. um, you read some of the original exploits of British mountaineering, and it really was a nationalistic idealism 
based not only on just like come back and put the flag on the top of the mountain, but it was also like there was colonial ideas. Like they were trying to open up Tibet and yeah. they were trying to open up relations with Nepal to like get into these countries so that England had a relationship with them. So, so yeah, but that's a hundred year old ideal. So yeah, no, I, the, the title, G, it was GQ, GQ that wrote it, um, written by Grayson Schaefer, who wrote a very great piece, but headlines are written by editors not the journalists so the headlines are written in a very yeah they try and make them as flashy and showy as tos- as possible i was i had more problems with the other the because it said inside free skier cody townsend's white knuckle plan to conquer north america's most dangerous mountains yeah, <laughs> like, i hate all that <laughs> i hate, I hate all, all that I'm sorry. i actually had <laughs> i had more of a problem with the subheading which was the world's most legendary free skier i'm like no <laughs> no <laughs> you're like i don't need that yeah life. totally because then they posted it on like they posted it online and like all my friends are laughing at me and making fun of me for that <laughs> yeah. no like if yeah, you guys like, heard I'm of dead. Candide? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I also like, you know, GQ, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Look at, look at, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> white knuckled conquering. Yeah. Um, my God. Editors, seriously. <laughs> like, um, I'm calling you out, whoever edited and wrote that title, because it's terrible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I do, actually, I do now kind of like the idea of white-knuckled conquering. Um, yeah. You really stuffed it all in there. Totally. So, yeah. In addition to all your friends just making fun of you with the subtitles. Yeah, so actually, totally. it turns out I, I'm in on the title. I'm back yeah. in. <laughs> um, let's keep it moving. Um, where do you want to go next? Um, I, this was a pretty interesting article. Um, Aspen Daily News. Um, the headline was Aspen Skiing Company on Lookout for Underground Ski Instructors, which is like, makes sense. We all know that in terms of like, you're not, you have to be employed by a ski area to take, to give instruction. And they even talk about what the definition of that is, uh, you know, an exchange of goods or services is like that is explicitly banned. So it's like, if you're kind of coaching your friend, that's definitely not under the definition of official instructors. And so you're like, okay, there, maybe there's been an influx of it and there's independent ski instructors and guides taking people on the hill and they're trying to crack down on it, making some PR stuff. But there was one line in it that actually drew my attention the most. Um, says the rogue instruction violates Skiko's, which is Aspen's parent company, Skiko's agreement with the U.S. Forest Service and breaches company policy. So obviously it breaches company policy, but the agreement with the U.S. Forest Service, that was something I had no idea about. And I was actually kind of interested and wanted to talk to you about of that essentially these Forest Service agreements are monopolizing a piece of land and nobody else on that piece of land is allowed to, I guess, monetize on that without the explicit permission of the National Forest Service. And then I dove in even deeper and there was hinted at this article, there's a story of Don Lemos, who's a legendary underground ski instructor who is a thorn in the side of Ski Co. And he challenged them for decades in court. Um, he was like his, uh, in, even it was in his obituary, was like labeled an underground ski instructor. And he was like, like hiding in the woods to meet with clients and running in disguise. Like this guy was like, he, he had like a massive clientele list of like Hollywood stars and wealthy business people and would like teach them and, and just like do sneak around Aspen mm. Ski Co. Well, it got to the point where they were, they busted him, tried to kick him off the mountain permanently, and he sued. He sued Aspen, mm-hmm. he sued the Forest Service, and went to federal court, and over uh, over more than a decade was going through appeals processes to try and get, you know, get this overturned that he was allowed to essentially instruct on Aspen's mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I can understand the basis from a company why you wouldn't want to have that happen but the question i had for you like, first is if like you had a magic wand should independent ski instructors be allowed to teach on ski area land yeah <clears throat> i'm really mad at myself because i keep kind of going back and forth on this me too um oh good i'm mad at you too yeah um <laughs> but because on the one hand i think you know we've we've 
talked a lot about, you know, um, sort of proper wages, affordable wages in ski towns. And, you know, I, I want um, ski instructors, very professional ski instructors who uh, have a lot of experience. I want those people to very much be able to have um, good careers, you know, in these places. And I can see how folks rolling in with, I love though the term rogue instructors. That's my favorite, rogue instructors. I wanna be one of those when I grow up. Um, it just sounds cool, but you know, so I, I don't like the idea of if it is undercutting a service and making it harder for a lot of good people that I'm sure you know and that I know here. Um, I, I don't want to see their livelihoods undercut And yet, I still have that idea that if there is someone that there have been relationships established there and you get along well with them, um, that seems difficult to say, like, this is actually illegal. Um, you know, so anyway, I'm going to stop with that. But yeah, it's like what I find interesting. So from the government side, and I actually went into the case ruling a little bit and read the government's arguments, and the government's arguments were essentially this guy needs to apply for a special use permit exactly like Aspen Ski Co. has. Mm -hmm. um, in the permits, I didn't know it, but um, ski areas have under all, every ski area that's on forest service land in North America has an obligation to provide ski instruction. Um, because it's part of their policies that they want to be able to have the public use these areas. So what was interesting about that was like there's already a precedent set for getting people on mountains. And so one, it brings up this totally side, bigger side topic of like, okay, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like does exclusion based upon cost become an issue? Is there, because there's a precedent set saying that like you have to provide uh, instruction for people so they can use for federal land and your ski area and your special use permit. Um, but so you could say, okay, well then the ski instructors, this rogue instructor, he could have filed a special use permit mm -hmm. and then pay the costs, pay the fees and get that. But to me, you'd be like, well, yeah, but then you're still going to be dealing with Aspen Ski Company mm -hmm. and any ski company, but we're just using Aspen in this example. So then would they even let you on yeah. their mountain? And that's the big thing that I'm really interested in is like, let's say this room was all ski instructors. We pooled all our money together. We wanted to start an independent ski instructor organization on Crested Butte Mountain Resort. Mm -hmm. And we're like, cool, we're going to file all the paperwork, get a special use permit, go through all the legal headaches of getting that. And let's say they actually give you that. Then you go to Crested Butte yeah. Vale and be like, okay, we're an independent ski instructor, we're gonna ski, you know, instruct on this land, and would they say no? And then what would be the legal repercussions of that? So this that was what I found the most interesting about this, is just this, like, there's so many layers to our federal management of ski areas that I don't think most of us know, unless mm -hmm. you're literally the legal team dealing with this. Mm -hmm. um, and it brings up just this, this question of like, to me, you're kind of like, well, this area then becomes monopolized and no one else can use it unless you're using that area. And sure, you can bring up a lot of different topics that would be like counteractive to that kind of sentiment that like, hey, like this should be a little bit more open to public and open to rogue instructors. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it just makes me feel uncomfortable at that point. Mm -hmm. So do you have a final verdict on this? Uh, no, more is just like, I kind of want to, I'm like more interested in this topic of because the, that, what we've talked about with the ski industry, the directions it's going, the economic impacts on the ski areas and the ski towns and all those kinds of things. And it comes back to always this question of like, 
how much can the federal government intervene and what sort of legal precedents are there? And so seeing this, that there is actually a legal precedent written in the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture's policy related to Forest Service land, that it has to be land that is accessible for all U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. And even though even there's policies that you have to legally provide instruction so that anyone can do it. So that I'm like, oh, that's actually like a, a thin opening. And I'm no lawyer and I'm, I'm talking out of my ass when it comes to legal side, but it seems like there's an opening there for challenge. And what we've talked about um, internally with groups of friends and is like, could the, could your local administrators, local forest service, federal um, departments have any impact on how these scary areas are run. And to me, I'm like, oh yeah, they totally could. Hmm. I need a palate cleanser. Ooh. Um, that got serious. Uh, so that of course means we're going to Canadian news. Um, this month's winner, and it's a doozy. <laughs> Best one yet in my opinion. Maybe. Um, someone stole this giant taxidermied polar bear from the Alberta Wellness Center. <laughs> and then the subtitle quote, I was shocked that someone would just come in and take him. <laughs> now, a problem here is that you aren't looking at the picture that we are looking at, um, but I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> So one of the greatest lines is there, it's on the second floor. I walked by it every single day to my office, but we were so used to him being there that no one looked up. We didn't notice until that day, then we called police. It had taken, I believe it was two to four days before they even noticed wait, a wait. polar bear wait, wait. being stolen. Before they even noticed that, and this is the first sentence of the article, a 500 pound stuffed polar bear named Harry was stolen from the wellness center. So this is a big thing and it's on the second floor. Yeah, like, but the second floor, like, you know, more like you're walking through the lobby of a hotel and it's above you, just hanging over you. And I was just like, wow, did they get that many polar bears? I didn't even notice that one was gone. I don't like. I just all of it. And it was, yeah, northern Alberta. Yeah, very northern Alberta. I just like that one taxidermy polar bear as a piece of decoration. Mm -hmm. Two, it got stolen. They're still looking for it, which is hiding a 12 foot tall, 500 pound taxidermy bear. Yeah. That's pretty difficult. And yeah, the, the, I mean, they just didn't notice it for days on end is yeah. amazing. My favorite part too, is they kept saying how they're looking for one guy. And I'm like, <laughs> one guy, the one dude who got out the 12 foot tall, 500 pound taxidermy polar bear from the second floor. Like I, if I want to meet that guy, yeah. like we should have him on reviewing well, the news. The thing about it is they talk about it being the security had gone off oh, yeah. for 24 hours. Yeah. So this was like inside yeah. job. This is like, like mission planned. impossible. Basically. Yeah. Like this guy had been in this wellness center. I am that polar bear for years. Mm -hmm. And he knew he heard security is going to have the day off. And he went in there and just yoinked that thing off the second floor hopefully maybe by himself because he wanted that polar bear yeah um i don't have a takeaway from this um but good job canada and um i guess i'm rooting for harry to be returned but i feel like the fact that they didn't even notice maybe i want the guy to keep it maybe he'll appreciate harry more that's true that's true anyway um where you want to go from here um do we want to go to Killington? Vermont? Let's go to Killington. We okay. should go to Killington. So I don't know if you guys saw this um, this recent article. Let me pop it back up. This was from the Boston Globe. Uh, headline, more than 20 sk skiers had to be rescued from the Killington, Vermont backcountry. But how did they all get lost? Um, so the story goes into two guys skiing together, going through the woods, and then end up 
in a zone they didn't expect to be. They're kind of down in a creek bed. They realize they're lost. They're off the ski area. They don't know where they are. And they start walking and trying to figure their way out. And then they start running into people. And then they start to running into more people. <laughs> and then it goes into a total of 23 people in this creek bed off some side of Killington, Vermont, <clears throat> including a ski instructor with two five-year-olds. <laughs> Seems like this was a rogue instructor. Yeah. <laughs> well, the next line I'll say he wasn't because this is what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So um, two of the ski skiers were minors and under the care of a ski instructor, and that instructor was immediately terminated. <laughs> Hillary said in an email, their PR representative, uh, the resort is working with Killington Search and Rescue to identify the guests who are among those lost on Saturday so that it can revoke their ski passes, she said. So this is the question yeah. to me. What is the over under on the number of skiers crossing into the backcountry getting lost? We're on one side it's an individual's action worthy of individual punishment, like pulling your pass. Yeah. And then the other side, it's a ski area's fault for 23 people getting lost into the same exact zone. Because they go into describing in some of the interviews with the lost people are saying that they didn't see a rope, they didn't see a sign. The ski area is saying they must have ducked, ducked a rope or you know gone by a sign and they're clearly marked. But like 23 people end up in the exact same spot. I'm guessing the ski area is to blame on this and why are they pulling their passes? But so the question, what's the number? Is it three, five? 10? 23. 23? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Obviously, 23. Um, so let me... Give me more about this instructor. These, <laughs> there was not, nothing more that other than they read the ski instructor, all of a sudden was there, and so all the people like felt like comforted because there was all of a sudden someone in like staff in like outerwear with a name badge and two five-year-olds. <laughs> And they're like, oh, well, must be not doing something wrong. And then I imagine that ski instructor realized that they were also in or the was shit. This, or was this like a David Koresh type of situation where, like, the <laughs> ski instructor was leading a new cult off into the – to start the church of the Killington Ravine or something? Like, I want to know – I need, I need like, a Netflix, you know, uh, miniseries on this instructor, I think. I, I will, would like to have imagined and been there to witness the scene. Let's say, like, Killington – for one thing, they pulled them out in the night. The search and rescue went in there and took like all through sundown to get all these people out. And I would imagine, one, if they wanted to revoke their passes, why weren't they just all like at the end of the trailhead, like Killington, like ski patrol sitting there and just yanking people's passes? Yeah. And then what that scene would have been like, like yeah. these people getting back, they're like, oh, finally, we're not lost. Yeah. We, we're it's, alive. It's temperatures were in the single digits yeah. that night. We're alive. And they're like, yeah, give me your pass. You're never skiing here again. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm pro not taking their passes. Yeah, I, I feel like they've endured enough. I feel like if you were pro, you're kind of a dick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've established that about me. Nope. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. Any le final thoughts on this? I'm fast. I want to hear from the instructor. Um, the 23 of you, I hope they list, I hope one of the 23 listens to this and like hits us up and tells us what happened. Cause I need more than what I'm getting out of this article. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I mean, it's interesting in the way that like you compare American resorts versus European resorts. Yeah. There's this like legendary line in Chamonix called Pas de Chèvre and people, you can just like ski to it and there's just tracks and people just ski down there and die all the time. And they're like, eh. <laughs> they, Stuff happens. They were stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas we you get ski you ski down something and it's like, you know, it's Killington, it's not as gnarly as the Potashev in, in Chamonix, but then all of a sudden you get your passes pulled for doing that. Like I just yeah. I feel like I wish there was a little bit more freedom with that. Um Kristen Sinat just texted me. My friend from Killington knows about where these people were going. He's sitting here. So 
<laughs> Wait, let's. I saw, uh, I saw a hand up. Let's uh, let's do this. There's a yeah. mic. <laughs> So the, the question we have to ask as you get up here is, do you feel like it would be easy to f go right. into this zone, especially if there was no rope there, just kind of like trickling off? Like, wh what is your opinion on that? I've been skiing there for 16 years, and I didn't know where that was oh. until this, huh. uh, this news came out. <laughs> Hmm. Um, but they were going to Cooper's Cabin, which is off the backside of Killington. And there are people that go there and probably know how to get around the backcountry and get out yeah. successfully. But if you don't know where you're going, hmm. you will be walking for many, many miles, yeah. as these folks were. Huh. Interesting. Coop Cooper's cabin party. So that's back to the theory that the instructor was like, yo, everybody, that's, we're, t we're taking a gaggle of people, including a couple five-year-olds for big underground rogue party at Cooper's cabin. But I will say the local media never disclosed who any of those people were either. Yeah. They're not Even snitches. Yeah. They, they did interviews. Um, yeah, they're... Yeah, it's Boston, man. I don't know if we're gonna know. <laughs> huh. I haven't encountered anyone yet so far, but hmm. I assume it was not the locals. Yeah, that's yeah. what it, uh, it doesn't seem. Like. It seems like <laughs> pure accident. Like one person kind of started skiing, then there's tracks, and you just kind of you flow into. Yeah. Unfortunately, that... it was below zero. Yeah. Hmm. Very very cold weekend, but you know. The time, like, there's lots of snow. Let's get out there. Yeah. And you follow someone and keep following someone else. And before you know it, yeah. mm -hmm. you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And luckily, there's a, a very active rescue organization in the area. And they're very fortunate. They, they were quick to respond. They knew right where, where they were, they were going to be able to find them, yeah. most likely. And it was very quick. And they got them out of there in mm -hmm. a reasonable amount of time. Wow. And <laughs> There's, I mean, I think every major ski area, thank you both thank so you. much for that. Thank you. Every, uh, every like major ski area that has like kind of some backcountry, there's always that one place where people go into and get trapped and whatnot. There's like Kyber's Pass on Whistler has mm -hmm. legendary yeah. stories. There's a legendary story of a guy that was uh, skied off the backside, got stuck out there within an hour and got so scared and so lost, he proceeded to shit himself because he thought it would keep him warm. And for then, warmth. yeah, for warmth. I mean, <laughs> wow. And then uh, started burning his money to try and start a fire, but it wouldn't <laughs> catch on fire. And they found him like in an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Um, man, we were talking about pooping in a bucket the last <laughs> panel session, and now we're pooping yourself to stay warm. I mean, you know, and failing to light your own money on fire. <laughs> okay. Um, my goodness. All right. We're going to do um, one mountain town advice question we received, but we're going to start with audience questions. But again, no pressure to ask them because we haven't talked about the NFL at all. Yeah. So, you know, just sit there if you like, but, um, you know, let's, it's, this is your, this is your, uh, this is your show. But I did want to, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. This, uh, this came into us from Pitt. Uh, hey guys, love every, ep love every episode of reviewing the news. Keep it up. Okay, I think we will. Um, I am a father of three kids, ages 14, 10, and 6. I was raised skiing here in Utah. Skiing is part of my family heritage, as most of us have worked in the industry or still do. So my kids do not have an option to, to not ski. We go every week and at least give it a few laps. Well, as many know, last season was the best season in Utah ever. But now my 14 year old who is in prime Grom age and stoked almost any time we go up, well, 
Now he has outrageous expectations after last season. If it's not 16 inches of pure Wasatch fluff, he thinks we only need to make three runs and then grab French fries. Um, I am not arguing that powder is the absolute best. I like to argue that. Chalk. Chalk. Anyway, um, I'm not arguing that powder is the absolute best, but I also want my kids to realize that fun is not predicated on snow conditions. You can have fun in powder, on bumps, carving, or just hopping around fun terrain features in low tide conditions. Thoughts or ideas here? What do we do with a now, I don't know, spoiled? Super. Is a U-tard in the making? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Um, <laughs> following that. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, getting on that, that's my philosophy of skiing is like any condition is fun. Like it's not the most amazing skiing right now. We're skiing some not great snow. It's still fun. Like no matter what on any given day, I feel like you can figure out some way to make the day enjoyable, whether that's like a little challenge, whether it's a little jump, whether that's carving, whether that's making your improving your technique, testing skis. Um, but the one thing I'm curious would need to know more information because I look back at my childhood and yeah, I remember amazing powder days and amazing ski days, but like every day I didn't care. I just wanted to go ski. And mm -hmm. I think the ultimate ingredient that made it fun was friends of a similar age that you're going out with. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm mm -hmm. interested here is, uh, you know, Skiing to me, and I heard it on the last panel session, is so much about the community, so much yeah. about friends, so much about just like mm -hmm. ripping with a, a group of like-minded individuals that are just like goofing around and having fun. And when you're a kid, I think that's even more special. Mm -hmm. And like friends that I made when I was 10 years old are still my friends because we have that common bond of skiing. So it would be interesting to see if being like, would it be worthwhile to do probably what is the hardest thing, because I imagine this father loves skiing with his children, and put him into a program, put him into free ride programs, put him into race programs, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is, to develop the love for all conditions by just going out there with friends. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I'm more curious about. I wish I could disagree, but I can't. <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, I think that's really important. And I very much like that idea of um, just continuing to get young people in and skiing together. And I think that's pretty key just as we think about the future of these activities and, and the like. So, yeah, yeah I like the other, that. The other thing, it's like games too, like yeah. playing games that with whatever it is, like even because I think about that with friends when you're young, it's whether it's like a jump and everyone's trying to spin their first 360s off it, but with your kids, can you create something on a hard pack groomer day that is sort of a game with rewards or competition to get them, you know, I don't know, it's like, can you lay over a carp and drag your hand on every turn down this groomer and, you know, mm -hmm. play some games with them to get them to appreciate the challenge of, yeah, making groomer laps, skiing mogul lines, like skiing chalky, chalky couloirs and stuff like that. That's That would be my other suggestion if there is already maybe a, a friend group of, the, of a similar age they're going out with. Hmm. All right, I don't see anybody at the mic, so let's talk about the NFL. Uh, <laughs> Super Bowl is next week. How are you feeling? Nervous. <laughs> I, I went to the Super Bowl in 2020, and I got my heart ripped out by one Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. I did. I, I don't know. If, yeah, we weren't doing the podcast then, but um, I tell you, I went to the single most depressing party I've ever been to it in my entire life because the, the Niners lost. Was it at Cooper's Cabin? <laughs> 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 Might have been. <laughs> um, went to. I got invited to go to the. Friends, family, and players after party. And the Niners, who were up 10 points in the last fourth quarter and blew it and ended up losing the Super Bowl in just like the most horrible fashion you can imagine, I went to that party for the team, family, and friends after that game. And it was literally family and a player standing in a circle and just sitting there silently, no drinks in hand, no food in hand, while like 
I don't know, some like flow rider, like major rappers playing in the background and then there's like booths where like we're in Miami people are hand rolling cigars and there's all these kind of like dancers and stuff and everyone just like standing in a circle silently just like looking at the ground (laughs) Elise and I hung out there for like an hour an hour and a half and we're like wow this is awful and uh, we were like planning we had a 6 a.m. flight we were planning to stay up through the night and go to that party and we left we left at like 3 30 because we we're like this this sucks this is terrible so that's <laughs> the emotion I'm carrying uh-huh. to this Super Bowl uh-huh. if you want to know I do I do want to know um, that surprises me a little bit because we see these NFL games and and then the players are all like dapping each other up from the opposing teams and like catching up. And sometimes you, you know, see a bad beat, a bad loss, and they're smiling. They're happy to see some people maybe they went to college with or whatever. So I guess I'm a little surprised to hear that when they got back to the team, or do you think everybody was like, we got to act sad, even no. though we're making millions of dollars? No, they were very, they very, were sad. very okay. sad. So. so the 49ers are sad when they lose. That's yeah. what we've learned tonight? Totally. Okay. They're, they're real football players, real competitors. So they're not in it for the money, I wow. like to say. Wow. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, does anyone want to answer? Have any questions? No, like, they just like NFL talk. Oh, we got, okay, we got to come up. Yeah. <laughs> so, two things that I know about it. Uh, the day before the 23 people were lost, five people got lost in the exact same spot and had to be rescued. And the week before, other people got lost in the same spot. Um, and I've been to Cooper's Cabin because I ski at Killington, or have skied most of my life at Killington. And um, it's not hard to go the right way back to the mountain (laughs) you have to be going supreme like all of Killington in that spot faces one direction it's not like Crested Butte where you could be going east west you know north like you could be going in any direction still be on the mountain there's only one direction to go and it's uh like basically northeast Mm. um so uh that's just what I heard about it um and the people who are in that group of five uh, outed themselves on Reddit and were talking about it and how they got lost and um, they all said that they were following tracks but I don't know it just doesn't doesn't all add up to me as a, someone who skied we there. Don't. We should give them a notice. Don't <laughs> and, go to Chamonix. And they were not locals. <laughs> so I was I was hoping to get up before you had the NFL talk as a Bay Area based Lions fan because I just Ooh. didn't want to hear Cody cry about going to a Super Bowl and losing. <laughs> what a privilege it must be to go and have the luxury of losing. I feel so sad. Yeah. Um, I've only won five, damn it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. This is why no one likes you. <laughs> oh, the Bay Area with uh, NBA championships. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Giants. Yeah, okay. Um, I know it's not this simple, obviously, Jonathan. Great, amazing panelists, amazing athletes. Uh, but it was a little weird seeing Cody, Elise, and Angel all on a list together and then thinking, where's Michelle Parker? You got her childhood best friend. You got two-thirds of all in. Oh, yeah. But you, you answer that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I think you know probably more about this situation than I do. But honestly, um, you know, uh, I've – kind of been leaving Michelle alone um, because she has, some of you maybe know about this, but um, you know, there are health issues with her father where she has really, um, you know, publicly stated that she is trying to dial back her commitments and how much she's doing. Um, and so there, there were uh, conversations about uh, Michelle coming out um, and I, you know, she, um, she works with Revel Shine mm-hmm. and who we're happy to have here and um, uh, talked a bit with uh, Jake Bilbro, the founder of Revel Shine, but we just both were like, yeah, I'm not, we're not even, there, no invite was extended, let's say, um, because um, she's been quite clear um, that she wants to, you know, be around and spending time with her, with her dad. And I very much respect that. And so, uh, would love to have Michelle here uh, sometime. This this just did not seem like the right year. So, yeah. 
Apologies if I should have asked, but it didn't it didn't feel like the right move. Yeah, totally. There's like two things. Obviously, she's become the primary caretaker of her father mm-hmm. and he's uh, got dementia and Parkinson's disease. So she's been just being an amazing person and just being like taking care of him every day. So mm-hmm. that's probably the primary reason. And I will say as a pro skier, like you have a very limited window of doing mm-hmm. your job and um, you have four months mainly and mm-hmm. you have January, February, March and April. And usually it really comes down to March and April and it usually comes down to April. Um, if you're, especially if you're a big mountain skier or backcountry skier and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's really hard to, as a professional skier, to have time commitments, anything planned out other than we're going to Alaska in April and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise it's, you have to be such on a swivel to be able to capitalize on any sort of film trip. Most film trips are last minute, any sort of other thing that is absolutely critical to your job and that is your job entirely weather dependent so um yeah that's the one thing i find it really hard to do is to be uh committing to anything like here like here's these two dates and you're like well yeah what if that's the week of the year and we're going up to canada to film at the scott skiing lodge it's like you just I almost lost out on your major opportunity for mm-hmm. the year. So that's one thing that could be t- tough as pro skiers to pull away time from that, especially when you're in the prime of your career, uh, which is someone like Michelle. And yeah. not saying that's this is the case there. I'm just yeah. saying in general, that's like what I have to do. It's actually one of the reasons when I started the 50, I told like, oh, I was getting starting to get pulled in so many directions with sponsors and obligations and shoots and whatnot. I told them all, I was like, as of January 1st, I will not be available. Like January 1st to April, I'm doing the 50 and the 50 only because I have to be on high alert for every single line. And it was like, sweet, I actually get to focus on skiing, Mm -hmm. not having to go to meetings and go to uh, photo shoots and all this kind of stuff. Cause there's a Seth Morrison said it once. He's like, the more famous I get, the less I ski. And it's very, very true. Hmm. So. Yeah. Back to the rogue instructor. Uh, so yesterday I heard somebody call them pirate instructors. Mm. No, but like, uh, wondering if good. you think there could be like a legal pathway similar to like an uptrack. That's like a, a loophole where you don't need to buy a lift ticket. Mm. Like, is it like, yeah, could could the uptrack be like a legal pathway similar to? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what is the? Because we don't have at my local ski area, Palisade State Saw, we have no uphill access. Really, um, and because it's mainly private land, huh. so they have full control to be able to not allow you on their land. And even in the summer, there's a lot of signs that saying you're not supposed to be on the trails and there's heavy equipment. Um, they're working on chairlifts and stuff, but they, they generally let it slide and it's okay. But what is it like here you have uphill access mm-hmm. and is that a national forest service policy where they allow, you have to allow that? I don't want to misspeak on this one. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I'm not certain. Um, probable, but not no. certain. Anyone know? No. That'll that'll be a topic I want to kind of dive into a little bit more yeah. because I do think like there it's 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 interesting. Like I totally get the business side of wanting to there's legal liabilities with a ski area. And if all of a sudden you have an independent company coming on and you know yeah. making money off of it, running a business off it, then there's things I could see that would be of issue. But at the same time, you're like, yeah, this creates some issues in the terms of like monopolizing a piece yeah. of land and then not allowing anyone to to do that yeah. to not have the freedom to like because like what the exchange of goods and services as a legal definition like i don't know like you take your friend out and he's going to buy you dinner for that night yeah. and it's, are they going to crack down on that like if they see you and you your buddy snow plowing in front of you and they're you're like you're not an instructor you can't talk yeah. to them and you're like what the hell <laughs> um so hmm. yeah, i don't know yeah So I know this is kind of uh, hot off the press, and in a a way it's a story we've heard many times before. I I was just wondering if you guys had any hot takes on A Basin selling to Altera. Yeah, we actually, we had talked about that and we didn't end up putting it on our list. Um, Overall, I don't think it's good. And that sounds like something pretty antithetical to even like I have a partnership with Palisades Tahoe and they're owned by Altera. It's part of the Altera company. 
<clears throat> I love Palisades. I love being a part of the team. I love promoting that mountain. I love the culture that has been there in skiing for a very long time. But ultimately, I'm getting more and more that some of the negatives of the new ski industry business is outweighing the positives. And we've talked about it a lot on mm -hmm. this podcast. And we get to the reasons why it makes financial sense to have more of your money up front so that you can better understand your payroll, better understand your cash flow, not have to rely entirely on mother nature to decide how many employees you're going to hire that year. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that they've talked about, and we, we see the crowds that are there, more people are getting passes and skiing is growing in popularity. But there's so many things to the, the opposite side of it that I think are starting to outweigh, in my opinion. And if you saw Altera recently raised $3 billion, um, that was pretty much right before they purchased A-Basin. And um, what it was is they were raising it to cash out some of their initial investors and then bring on a whole new swath of investors. The only re reason they're going to be able to raise $3 billion at this late stage in the game is they're going public. And then the trappings of a public company dictate quarterly profits. Um, what I'm seeing is this duopoly in skiing being not a good thing in uh, overall. And what I saw as a basin, and we referenced it on the very last podcast, was kind of the one ski industry model, they bucked the Icon Pass, had a challenging year financially because of it, and then the next year had one of their best years ever. So it was kind of like, okay, this model can still work. And to see most major ski areas in the country go to this business model, which has some pretty drastic side effects, I don't think is positive. And then even if you get into just competition, which is at the root of a free market capitalism, mm -hmm. going into uh, two publicly yeah. traded companies dominating the industry, that is not going to be good. And I don't care, like, you can say whatever you want, you could debate. It's good for, you know, a majority of skiers coming from the Denver area, they get to ski <clears> more, that's great, there's positives to that. It's bad for locals. What, it, those debates are meaningless to me. More it's just that there's going to be a duopoly dictating the entire culture of skiing, and that's what I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, I'd suggest if uh, there's this guy I follow, Matt Stoller, um, he writes a substack called Big. It's all about corporate mm -hmm. consolidiza consolidation and monopolization over the last 40 years, and it's really, really insightful. So um, it's kind of made me learn more and more about corporate consolidiza consolidation and how bad it is for us as consumers. And so that's the thing I don't like about it. It's not necessarily like Altera, they do some great things. Like mm -hmm. they do the partnership with Native Outdoors, yeah. they do, they're doing much more, like they do lots of things to get young people into skiing, get people from um, like disadvantaged communities into skiing. They're doing things I think are positive, but I just don't like the corporate consolidation of it all. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I gotta slightly, I don't disagree with the take. I, Luke Jacobson, actually, another person I hate giving credit to. Um, but uh, on our ski design and manufacturing panel the other day, said something that I've been thinking a lot about since he said it. Um, <clears throat> he said, you know, uh, talking about moment um, and Ben Anderson talking about Icelandic, he said, you know, we're skiers first and business people second. And um, as we are talking about all kinds of issues from climate to what's happening to our ski areas, uh, to media, which we were just talking about, and you know who owns what media entities, um, I absolutely don't want to be one of these people that just, um, I think, naively uh, never wants to talk about business realities or I don't I don't I don't want to do that at all but I do think that if we are talking about um really um 
maintaining, cultivating rich communities around these passion things, whether that would be skiing or any other number of activities, um, man, I want people and entities that have that first commitment to the community because when it's business first and then skiing or fill in your, the blank with whatever hobby pastime you're into. Um, and I, I, you know, I do worry about that a lot when you could, because when, when you IPO, you are legally bound to be business first. You now have a legal obligation to shareholders where you can go to prison if you aren't basically optimizing returns. And so um, I think that is just a good thing. You know, I think that probably throughout our conversations, I've been more um, willing because in part because I think I get tired of what I think are stupid Instagram comments that just want to complain and give no a time or attention to like, okay, cool. How do you want to pay for that? Right. Um, so I want to acknowledge those, the business side, but I still like to see when there are folks at the helms or communities at the helms that are like, the first thing we're trying to do is preserve something or cultivate something or grow something in a way that will be good for a town, for an area, for a sport, et cetera. And then we're gonna try like hell to make really smart business decisions to be able to go back and sustain the first thing. So I don't know. Um, well, I think there's a big shift. It's, it's shareholder capitalism versus the, in the Jack Welch form of capitalism the, that became, he was the most heralded CEO of the 80s and 90s because he returned so much to investors by running GE. And then as it came out, his post-retirement, it was just all a house of cards mm -hmm. and yep. very fraudulent uh, financial activity. But in those 20 years, he was the hero to business. And we've seen business culture since the 80s be dominated by shareholder capitalism, where the shareholder is the most important part as opposed to the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what scares me about this is because ultimately it's a private equity firm. So a private equity firm is private investors trying to get a return. That is the thing they're most concerned about. As they go public, like you said, then it becomes more of a legal obligation to those shareholders. And that's where it starts to, you know, we talked about it even earlier, like Crested Butte, every ski area has a monopoly on that ski area, on that land. They are the main source of income for most <coughs> ski towns. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes, that ski area turns to strictly focused on shareholders, then the side effects I think are generally negative. And like we could say like the business model that is, was invented by Vail, whatever it is, they, there are some positives to it. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, pretty much everyone here's ski pass has gotten cheaper over the last 20 years, which is not a bad thing for diehard skiers. So you can't say it's just all bad, but there's just the overall culture, which you're talking about. I think there's, yeah, there's some, there's some downside effects that I don't think are good for, for ski towns in the long run. And I just liked even just that a basin was like kind of the, the one holdout and they, they bucked the trend and were successful for it. So to see that not to, to go into the consolidation model, it's like, it's disconcerting for sure. Um, because ultimately like at one point, most of the ski areas could be owned by two companies and then we don't have choice anymore. And the only way to continue to return profits to shareholders is by increasing costs because they're not gonna increase people. We're seeing a max out on the amount of people that are at a ski area on a weekend and a holiday, mm -hmm. and it's gonna be increasing costs or some other form that is not necessarily beneficial to the, the town, the community, ski culture or skiing. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, I did kinda, I, I actually, it was the first time I had like kind of a negative reaction. It was like a little, I was definitely bummed. Hmm. Last question. Maybe to end on a lighter night, a lighter yeah. note. Uh, by my count, there's about 98 people in the room. 
Does that is that close enough to officially oh. put to bed the like hundred viewers, or is that not no, quite close enough this is for every you? Every listener ever of the <laughs> podcast today. <laughs> I I, fl- I flew them in. Yeah. Hey, I've I've got actually one last question for you. I'm just curious. I think we're gonna not do like the what we're reading and watching thing, mm-hmm. but um, I'm actually I started thinking about this during the panel. I'd love to see like a show of hands. Have any of you gone and read something or watched something that we talked about, um, you know, just through some of the... Oh, yeah. Nice. Cool. The Bear Friday Night Lights. The Bear. Friday Night Lights. Yes, you win. You win the panel session. Succession. Succession. Yeah. There you go. Um, Of the book. Breath. Yeah. 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 Breath. Um, By the way, how many of you think that Cody is um, probably failing to understand the bear and not appreciating it properly. <laughs> Wait, how many of you think he has it properly appreciated? Yes. That's fewer. I win on that one. Okay. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah, a lot of, lot of hands, a lot of hands up. And that's a fun, that's really a fun benefit that we get to, hey, this stuff is, you know, come onto our radar and we're enthusiastic about it. And it's really fun to get to share that with a lot of people. And we get a lot of emails and comments uh, from folks. And that's, I think, been uh, one of the really rewarding things of doing this. And, and, uh, and thanks to all of you who do write in uh, with story ideas and the rest. And it, it's just become a really fun uh, back and forth. So um, thanks for all of you for that. And man, it's really fun to get to do this in person. And so... Maybe you just need to move here, and then we just hold, you know, we just do it live from now on. But then you have to ski moguls, which you were kind of wimpy about. (laughs) And you said earlier, you're like, I mean, we're skiing like just some okay conditions. I thought they were really good. So there's the reason. (laughs) (laughs) You just laid it out right there. Um, weren't you making fun of people from Utah a little bit ago because they only yeah. like to like ski ski pow, but like you don't like skiing moguls. And several times I was like, we can go ski these bumps. You're like, but there's a groomer right there, right? And it's yeah. like, I'll just catch you back. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, we make fun of people from Utah just because <laughs> they talk about Utah a lot. <laughs> oh, you, unlike people from California? Yeah, no, not as much, not as much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. That's it. But the, you, it's a healthy rivalry. But you're really not that much of a mogul skier. No, not really. <laughs> Let's end on that uh, really anticlimactic <laughs> note. <laughs> I mean, we did sort of say there'd be a bit of a competition. I don't know. I think I actually think you did. If I'm being objective, I think you did great tonight. I'm I'm happy to have you here. It's good to be here. I wasn't going to bail on you all, and I was going to ski on a broken arm that was going to need surgery after because I think that highly of all of you. So I don't know. Does he uh, tie? No, we'll give it. He wins. We'll give it to you. All right. We'll give it to you. Thanks, everybody. My ego needs that. My ego needs that. (laughs) 